Today, doctors have limited windows into what goes on inside our bodies. You know this, they can talk to us, they can take scans, they can sample body fluids, they can even take a look at our genetic profile. And these are powerful tools, but they're infrequent. And they're often better for diagnosing an illness than detecting it early. But one day soon, we'll put tiny implants the size of a grain of rice inside our bodies, next to organs, alongside nerves, inside blood vessels, maybe someday even in our brain. And every morning, these little implants will chirp out information about how your kidneys are doing, or your liver, or the nerves that sense inflammation, or control digestion. So I know what you're thinking, there's no way my doctor wants all of that data, or there's no way I want all that data, I'm bombarded with way too much data as it is, and I get it. But think about the rise of wearables. Right? Your watch doesn't have a calories burnt sensor. It has tiny little gyroscopes and accelerometers that measure all sorts of body motion. From these measurements, the watch calculates something about your gait and estimates how many steps you've taken. From that estimate and some personal data, it'll guess how many calories you've burned. If your watch has a heart rate sensor, all the better. If someday a wearable were to, say, measure respiratory output, even better. The point is, you never see all that data underneath. The system essentially surfaces the information you care about as it merges it into an ever-improving picture of your health. In the same way, we'll collect information from internal organs and key nerves, and merge it with yours and perhaps others' data to look for tiny clues that something might be going wrong. So that long before your conscious mind is aware that something is wrong, the data would show a trend. This is not science fiction. Colleagues and I have been working on this problem, and a few years ago, we made an observation about physics that will help make this future possible. You see, for a long time, engineers have wanted to make very small medical implants completely wireless. Like, if you look at a 1980s cardiac pacemaker, for instance, you'll see a little can about the size of an old iPod with wires coming out of it, right? A similar device today might be the size of a USB stick. But either way, all of these devices have batteries inside them and radios that need antennas or electromagnetic coils and all of that limits how small we can make the implant. So you might think, make those radios you know, even smaller. Chips today are the size of a grain of sand, right? What's the, what's the difference? The difference is that we hit a wall in the physics of electromagnetics and radio waves. Humans are basically big bags of salt water, and radio waves at these frequencies don't easily penetrate us. Instead, the energy is absorbed and converted into heat. It's the reason your cell phone isn't going to work underwater, even if you've got it in a Ziploc bag, or say a submarine has to more or less surface to receive transmissions. So if you're trying to communicate with an implant using these types of radios, you're kind of stuck. You have either have to have it somewhat large or park it just under the skin. But we want to make implants that are much smaller, you know, a millimeter in size, or maybe smaller, maybe the diameter, or the, the width of a human hair. And we want to put them really deep inside the body. So what we realized was that the magic lay with ultrasound. That simple realization is one of the few eureka moments I've ever had in my life. At the time, with colleagues, we had been experimenting with making smaller and smaller brain implants, and we hit this issue with radio waves. And I was, out of frustration, I went back to Physics 101, and I made a list of all the different types of energy I could think of. So like X-rays or infrared radiation, you know, you, you get the idea. And I was sitting in my car in downtown Berkeley in the winter of 2013, and I'm going through this list, and I get to ultrasound, and at first I thought, 
no way, that's, that's too simple. And I kept going, but I came back to it and I started thinking, wait, maybe this could work. And then by the time I ran in rather late to a work meeting with all these same colleagues, I was pretty convinced. I said, no, this is it, this could work. And then I spent the, the whole night and the next morning sort of working out the math and off we went. True story. <laughs> the idea is uh, pretty simple conceptually. Sound waves, unlike radio waves at these frequencies, go through the soft parts of your body without much trouble. You all know this if you've gone in to get a medical ultrasound. So when you go in to get an ultrasound scan, a clinician will move a little paddle with gel over your skin and like an image forms on a screen, right? What's happening is that that paddle is emitting ultrasound and the, the ultrasound is reflecting back from your organs and those reflections are used to construct the image. But we needed ultrasound to do more. We needed ultrasound to power an implant and bring back information. It turns out that there is a crystal, type of crystal, that's long been known to have a wonderful property. If I take that crystal and I hit it with ultrasound, it'll vibrate. And it'll convert some of that mechanical energy into electrical energy. So if I take one of these crystals, half a millimeter in size, put it in an implant, and connect it to, say, a computer chip, that crystal can power the computer chip when I hit it with ultrasound. But we can go one step further we can have the computer chip change how the crystal vibrates. Okay, so imagine the crystal is a tuning fork, and the chip is my finger. And so I set the tuning fork coming, right, and I tap it. As I tap it, the sound you hear changes. In a similar way, the computer chip can change the way the crystal vibrates and how much ultrasound gets reflected back from the implant. And in these tiny little changes, you can encode digital bits just as if I were tapping out Morse code on the tuning fork. So send, say, 10 pulses of ultrasound into the body, and 10 pulses are going to reflect back from the implant. If the implant wants to send a string of digital bits, say, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, it would tap the crystal at the second, third, and sixth reflections. I think I got that right. And those changes would be detectable outside the body. That's the magic. I send ultrasound into the body. It washes over an implant and powers it up. And some of that ultrasound just bounces back, but now loaded with data. And the amazing thing is, we can put all sorts of sensors into these implants. So, Pressure and oxygen sensors in key arteries could tell us about cardiac state. Sensors connected to organs would warn us of decreasing function. Nerve recording electrodes could give us a wealth of information about the organs in our torso. For example, the vagus nerve has tens of thousands of axons that communicate and send information to and from your brain and your larynx, your diaphragm, your stomach, your heart, the sensory functions of your ear and your tongue, and these visceral organs I was talking about, like your liver. We could even have the implant change the information in the nerves by applying electrical stimulation, modifying how the nerves are firing. So all of this is possible with implants the size of a grain of rice. Today, one area of medicine where these types of implants could save lives is in organ transplants. Organ transplants are one of the miracles of modern medicine. And, you know, one of the things we worry about when we transplant a precious donor organ into a recipient is whether or not it will thrive. And today it's very, very difficult to predict whether a transplant is going to fail or why it is failing until it's too late. But if we could put these sensors into the organ just prior to transplant, we could then monitor it hour by hour maybe, over those crucial first few weeks, allowing clinicians to adjust therapies before organ failure ever happened. But how might this affect healthcare beyond organ transplants? Think about your liver. Okay, so as your liver goes about its business detoxifying your bloodstream and synthesizing critical proteins, dozens of variables are changing. 
what proteins are being made, how much oxygen your liver is consuming, maybe there are even minute temperature fluctuations. If your liver were to slowly begin to fail, these variables would slowly begin to change, but you might not have any symptoms for a long time. Eventually, you'd get, you know, you'd feel fatigue or you'd get swelling in your legs or more likely a routine blood test might show that something is going wrong, but by then your liver might be quite damaged. Consider a different scenario. 20 years from now, a genetic screen determines that you're at risk for liver disease. In addition to lifestyle counseling and education on treatment options, you're given a tiny sensor that tracks organ function. Okay? You monitor your liver regularly without ever having to go to the hospital. Over weeks and months, as your data profile builds up, you start to see patterns. You learn how your everyday habits are affecting your liver and you're empowered to make wiser decisions. At the same time, your clinician has data that they can use to adjust drug timing or drug dosing to better manage your therapy. All of this would work together to provide powerful management for a very difficult disease. Eventually, sensors like this would become commonplace for everyone. They would monitor multiple organs and key nerves and provide an early warning system for our health. But beyond providing better therapies, the crucial point is that systems like this would increase our agency. Once we can see what our everyday habits do to our organs in tangible, visible ways, we can build habits that reinforce healthy living, wiser choices, and more positive outcomes. In a sense, these implants can be tiny windows that form a direct link between our conscious self and our organ function. You know, this would lead to healthier, longer lifespans. It would allow us to use health dollars for detection and prevention and healthy living instead of sick care. But I think what this future promises is more profound than that. It means less apprehension and less doubt about our health, our bodies, and our minds. The emotional toll of uncertainty plagues us, especially as we grow older. What goes on inside our bodies as we age can be mysterious and unsettling and often very scary. And this directly affects our quality of life. Look, sure, there, always, there will always be unknowns. But through these tiny windows, we can shed light into previously dark corners. We can empower ourselves to better health. And ultimately, we can simply enjoy a fuller sense of self, of who we are. Thank you.